Welcome to another episode of the magazine. Today we're very gifted to have Jack Spillane with us here today. So welcome to the show, Jack. Nice to be here, Charlie. So let's get right into it. Tell us how you started on this career path, your background, your education. Okay, so I am... Um I, I was teaching school, but I had always wanted to be a reporter and a writer. I had written a little bit for my high school newspaper, but I guess I wasn't really in the mainstream of it. And um, I just uh, finally, uh, uh, I remember my sister said, well, if you really want to do it, just do it. So I didn't have a job, so I began freelancing. And back in the day, this is the late 1970s, I guess, um, if you wanted to freelance, it wasn't, you didn't have to have a degree or anything. You just um, gave them a writing sample because okay. they did have to have somebody that could write reasonably well because they just couldn't spend the whole time cleaning up your copy. And right, right. Um, I went, I took their writing test at a little paper called the Lincoln Journal in um, central Massachusetts. And um, the editor, her first name was Marjorie, I can't remember her last name. She looked at it and she said, I can work with you. Oh. And so <laughs> that's how I started. Um, okay. So, uh, the great thing was it was a learn-on-the-job type experience. Um, I later did a, a master's degree in journalism at, at Emerson. Okay. But I, um, when I first started out, it was just they throw you in the pool and, and they see if you can swim. So you would go to these government meetings with small towns mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. you, would, you would cover the copy and you're told to be honest, never do a direct quote unless you have the direct quote, mm -hmm. and um, uh, write short. Was, was their own advice. And so I did well enough that, that I went from there to a, 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 another paper that was a little bigger, and um, the rest is history. <laughs> so what was it like being a reporter at first? Well, I, you know, I, I always wanted to be a reporter. I, 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 was, um, I felt from the beginning honored to, um, to be able to do it because I didn't feel like I, I naturally had the personality to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you could put me in a room full of people and I would be the guy standing in the corner not talking to anybody. Cause, and it's not that I'm shy, I'm, I'm, just, um, I'm just not self-confident enough, I think, to do that. But I think having the name of the paper behind me gave me a self-confidence to, to, to mm -hmm. uh, fill that role. And um, I had grown up steeped in politics because my father was very, even though he was not a politician, was very interested in politics, and so um, it came sort of naturally to me. And um, so I started working part time for these papers, and I did well. And eventually, I got a full time job, and that's how it started. And that's how it started. What are some other roles that you've had in media? So I've been pretty much in uh, print journalism all the time. Uh, I, I've done a little bit of uh, cable TV at Boston Neighborhood News um, when I was in school. Mm -hmm. um, I've done. Um, some freelancing, uh, doing research for Life magazine uh, oh, wow. for a while. Um, uh, but it's mostly been newspapers, uh, mostly been either a reporter, columnist, or an editor. Sometimes people don't quite get the distinction between a columnist and a reporter. A columnist um, is allowed to give their opinion. It's okay. a perspective. A reporter, it's just the facts. So, so what are some of the challenges of being an editor? <laughs> uh, so you know, I, I don't know if I was naturally a a gifted editor, um, and I was not an editor for that long. I think uh, four or five years. I was the news editor at the the Standard Times. Okay. Um, so I really like working with young reporters, and um, a lot of reporting is is talking out a story, trying to understand both sides, trying to figure out where to do the research, who to call, mm -hmm. all of that. So I enjoyed that work. I think. When you're the boss, it's a hard thing to do to, and, and you would know this, Charlie, <laughs> to inspire people to do things on their own because in the end they have to, you know, perform on their own. Right. And I think that, um, you know, I went to um, school way back when with nuns and okay. and brothers yeah. after that, mm -hmm. and so uh, I came from the old school, the the big boss just orders you to to do things, and I I don't think at that. that uh, worked that well for me. I think that in this day and age, you have to inspire people. Right. You have to get them to buy into your vision and and to want to perform for you. I, I thought that the longer I did it, um, I did better, but I, I'm not sure you'd have to ask for the people that work, worked for me. <laughs> That's great. Um, so I asked you about what was the most challenging, but what was the most rewarding? Well, you know, I, 
I get up every day and just thank my lucky stars that I found out that this was the role for me being a, a, a community journalist. Um, I've never wanted to do anything else. Once I found this, mm -hmm. uh, I never have really wanted to do anything else. I, I think it's an important role in society. Um, at this level, it's not rewarded that well, but um, it was rewarded well enough for me. Um, uh, I, I just think it's an important role, and as newspapers have begun to struggle, communities have realized how important it is if they can't get basic information. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I just thank my lucky stars every day that I have the privilege of following government, following human interest stories, people's lives, um, getting to talk to people, finding out how things work, um, and then being able to um, write a story to let the public know about that. It, it, it just suits me well, and, and I, I just thank my lucky stars that I've, I've been able to do it, so I guess I would say everything about it. That's great, thank you. Um, so you've seen a lot from becoming a, a reporter at first, and then the transitions with journalism, and you know, getting a paper at in the morning, and then the evening paper to uh, what it is today. How 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 has that changed? So it's funny when when I first started this business in in the seventies, newspapers were already start struggling, and there was a lot of predictions that at that time television and radio were going to be the end and that mm -hmm. you'd have all these cable television stations and all this uh, proliferation of electronic media and that people didn't have time. And yet all the time I was in, in my early years, papers struggled, but they didn't struggle so much as when the internet came along. So um, the newspapers in my early days were afternoon papers and you worked these dreadful shifts called the split shifts. So you came in from six to 10 to cover the night meetings. And then you came in at 6 o'clock in the morning again to write until 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. The paper would go to press at noontime and come out in the afternoon. It was a tough schedule. You, you really had to love it. Mm. I, I can't count all the people that liked it to an extent but got out of it because they wanted to have a life. Um, it's not for everybody. A lot of alcoholism in journalism uh, mm -hmm. because of the, the pressures of it. Um, but it, 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 it always worked for me. Um, uh, as time, it wasn't really until I was down in New Bedford, and I would say maybe 10 years into my career in New Bedford, that um, the internet really blossomed. It, it was sort of on the fringes in the early 2000s, but I would say around 2010, 2011, mm -hmm. everybody was online, everybody had a cell phone, and there was a time when newspapers had all the car ads, all the real estate ads, all the classified ads, and every site on the internet now had that. So people think that newspapers make their money from circulation. That's just a small portion. Okay. The, the biggest portion was always the advertising revenue, and we lost huge amounts of that to the internet where every car dealer could have their own ads mm. on their own site. Same with real estate. Uh, even even classified, you know, you had sites for that. So um, a lot of people feel that newspapers did not see it coming early enough and that the, the people that owned the papers didn't um, adjust. Whatever the reason, the business model didn't work anymore. Uh, I would say starting about 10, 12, you know, years ago. And it was, it was just going off of a cliff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I got to the Standard Times, we had 16 full-time reporters okay. and, column, and a couple of columnists. Mm -hmm. um, when I left, we had one columnist, which was me, and three reporters. Wow. So it just collapsed. Um, uh, they just could not make any money. And people who live here have noticed that now the Fall River paper, the Brockton paper, the Taunton paper, the New Bedford papers share a lot of the same stories. The same thing happened to the Dartmouth Chronicle and the Fairhaven Advocate. I know you have Fairhaven Neighborhood News now, but mm -hmm. but you know they began to share copy because they couldn't afford to hire enough reporters, and there was less and less local news. Oh, wow. And it really um, began to be very discouraging because um, you knew that there were stories that you couldn't get to, and people thought that 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 the paper had just gotten lazy or, or, or who didn't understand that the business model didn't work anymore, couldn't quite understand it. Um, so uh, 
that's what happened. What would you, so with all that in mind, what would you advise people who want to go into journalism today or to be a reporter? Well, it's tough. I think it's going to be different. At the New Bedford Life, which is a nonprofit where I work now, um, we do a lot of stuff that is designed for social media. And the young people are especially good at that. Old guys like me, not, not so much. Um, uh, so we'll do things that are designed. We just started a week ago with things designed for TikTok, which you, you may not realize that, but TikTok has a, a, a bigger reach, especially among young people, than Facebook or Instagram or anything. Yeah. And so we do, we do things that are designed for social media in small bites okay. to try to get people interested. And then if we can get give um, them that stuff in the small bites, we can link to our longer stories, our longer videos online. Mm -hmm. So that's where the industry is going. And I think that young people... Well, certainly if you go to the metropolitan areas, which has always been the case, mm -hmm. you can make a good living in Boston, New York, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, but at a community level, like New Bedford, Fall River, Dartmouth, Fairhaven, um, it really is very hard to make a, a living right now. I think there are a few people who are in editing positions, okay. and the, the reporters um, make almost a minimum wage job. I don't, it might be a little bit higher than that, but, but not much. Um, so those folks really struggle. And I think that the industry is going to reinvent itself. You have nonprofits like um, uh, the New Bedford Light. Uh, there's one in Concord, Mass. There's another one in Pittsfield. They're popping up. And they are working on the public radio, public television model. So we don't charge anybody. We're only online. And then you can um, uh, send us a donation. And we have fundraising drives. Where, you know, we had a big one at the Black Whale okay. recently. Um, where we basically do what PBS does and says, do you like our stories? We're doing these investigative stories that nobody else can get to. We're bringing you Jack Spillane's analysis. Uh, if you like what we, we, we bring you, send us a, um, uh, a donation. Okay. Uh, and you can uh, go on the New Bedford Light website, newbedfordlight.org. Uh, oh, by the way, we're always free. Um, which uh, is not the case for a lot of websites, news websites that you go on. That's a decision we've made because mm -hmm. we realize people have limited income, but we do hope if they if they like us, they'll they'll send us a donation. Yeah. So how? So you mentioned how to get in touch with Bedford Light, but what if someone has a story? Would you you go out there and record the story or report the story? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we have now. I think when we started out, we just had myself, uh, an editor and uh, uh, a top editor, and uh, that was it, I think, a couple of freelancers. Now we have five or six full-time reporters. Oh, wow. So, okay. it, um, yeah, it, so uh, I think um, I'm not sure why people don't know as much about us as, as, as they might. Um, the New Bedford Light, um, if you go on, so I, I, you can always criticize any website, but I think sometimes you have to look for how to contact us. Okay. So we have a thing called, um, oh my goodness, I'm going to forget it, uh, getting so old. Um, I think it's, there's one called Civic Life, where it's a Civic Life calendar. Mm -hmm. Another, which is Arts and Culture, the Arts and Culture calendar. And another is Voices, where you can write us a letter to the editor. And I think mm -hmm. somewhere among all those you know, because everything's a form nowadays. It used to be email. Already right. email is kind of outdated. Right, right. Um, so you, you fill out the form and you send us a news tip. Okay. You, um, uh, the same thing with a, a letter to the editor. I think if you look hard enough, you'll find the editor's email address somewhere sure. on that site. Um, that's sort of a pet peeve of myself, and I don't want to be criticizing my own organization, but I, I do think we need to be reader-friendly mm -hmm. so it's easy to figure out how to contact people. Um, uh, but we're, we're right there. So it's New Bedford Light, L-I-G-H-T. L-I-G-H-T. Dot yeah. com. Yeah. No, not, not dot, dot org. Dot org. Okay. Yeah. Not, not light beer for milk. <laughs> <laughs> no, the real light. <laughs> so uh, over your career, you've done amazing, and you've won some awards. Can you talk a little bit about some of the awards that you've won? Yeah, I, I've won a few, but I, I wouldn't say that there's that many. I, I, I've been lucky enough here and there to win a couple of investigative awards when I was reporting, um, some government and political writing things. Most of them are from the New England Newspaper Association okay. or the New Hampshire Press Association. I was up in New Hampshire for a while. Um, uh, uh, 
so I, yeah, I, 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 I've won a few and lost a bunch, uh, but, but um, it's good to be recognized sometimes. So in 2019, uh, you won the Alan B. Rogers Award. Why was that so important to you? Yeah, that, that's probably the most important award I've won. So that award is given to the best editorial writer in newspapers in New England. And I won it for an editorial I wrote on um, undocumented immigrants. Okay. And uh, the immigrants in New Bedford who are crossing the border. And there was a lot of anti-immigrant rhetoric in the country at the time. And I basically wrote it from the standpoint of the children who come over with their parents okay. and really have no choice but to you know, come to this country and the dire circumstances that they're in in their, their native countries. And you know, I, I, I wrote it from the standpoint of they are human beings and we, we need to treat them mm -hmm. humanely. I know that there are issues around immigration. I feel badly that the country has not solved them for 30 years. I, my own recommendation would be for both parties to swallow their prides and compromise mm -hmm. and find something in the middle where they can come up with a lot of the problem is the quotas are too low. But um, uh, that, that meant a lot to me because it was based around um, New Bedford children coming to the, the, the city, 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 and um, I'm, I'm, I'm part of that, that award. Well, I can see why you won yeah. the award. But congratulations on that also. Has there been any other compelling stories that have really, over the years, has really touched you in a, in a very, you know, like, like awesome way that you didn't know it until you went to go and do that? You know, they, they all kind of run together. I know early in my career I did a, a, a big investigation about um, uh, unlimited sick and vacation pay that employees mm -hmm. in a municipality I was covering could accrue, could accrue, and um, that was my uh, an eye opener for me as to um, sometimes um, benefits that get out of control for, for, for people that are in government. Um, you know, I I'm a progressive by nature. I'm not an anti-government guy, but mm -hmm. that was a, a a big story for me in in New Bedford. Um, I think a lot of the coverage I've done over the years has been about the political machine okay. that operates mm -hmm. here and. Um, uh, you know, I think that people oftentimes depend on their friends to help them. Nothing wrong with that. Right. But I think that we need to be open about what's going on in government. And um, we need to make sure everybody has equal access. So I think a lot of those stories uh, have been meaningful to me. Um, because, you know, I, I'm on the spot a little bit. I, 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 know, think, I, I think driving home, I'll probably think of a few. But, <laughs> you know. So what's, what's the future? What's the future plans? So, you know, Charlie, I'm, I'm 70 years old now, so I'm, I'm yeah, retired. You look great for 70. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just trying to um, uh, get uh, a couple more years in. I wanted to help get this paper started sure. because um, with the traditional private sector papers struggling, I felt this nonprofit paper would be good for the region. So I'm, I'm trying to help them for a year, uh, maybe get myself a little bit uh, firmer footing for retirement. Mm -hmm. And then we'll see. I, I've, I've always wanted to write some longer form things, maybe a book, um, do some volunteer work, uh, travel a little bit. We'll see. So what has been the biggest story yet with New Bedford Light? Biggest story yet for New Bedford Light? You know, I'm embarrassed because when people ask me these things like that, I, 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 I really, I, I think, well, I, I'll talk about a couple of stories that I didn't do, but I think were really important. Mm -hmm. And one was uh, an investigation that our reporter, Will Sennett, did okay. about the um, internationalization of the New Bedford waterfront okay. and how corporate interests had taken over a lot of the small boat-owned fishery mm -hmm. so that now the fishery is, is owned not only not locally in New Bedford but out of the United States okay. and uh, by companies that are, are organized in, in Europe and, and, and other places and how that has sort of um, removed us from ownership of our own waterfront. I thought that was a really important one yes. that we did. Um, uh, yeah. And you, and you said you had another one, though, but it wasn't by you reporting well, it. Well, that, that one was not by me. That yeah. was by Will Sennett. Okay. Um, part of the New Bedford Light. The part of the New Bedford Light. Um, you know, I, I, I think I'm proud of, of, of some of the stories I've done on the 
immigrant and Latino populations of New Bedford because mm -hmm. I think that they're an unseen population. I know there's a lot of criticism sometimes, but the vast majority of these people are hardworking people. They largely work in our seafood houses and in um, drywalling, mm -hmm. roofing, um, landscaping, uh, uh, house cleaning. Uh, people come here because they lack opportunities in their own countries or their own countries are even dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I feel that a lot of people feel strongly, and I understand that they, they should follow the rules, but what they don't know is that the quotas for people from Central America are much lower than the quotas from people coming from Northern Europe or some of the more developed countries. So the reason people can't come legally is because there just are not enough slots. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, we need the workers. Um, you know, that these people are, are able to get jobs. And, mm -hmm. and so I have felt that uh, those stories are important. You know, we're all, most of us are children of immigrants, whether it's second, third generation. And so um, I've been proud of those stories. So I think you definitely have the vision of the power of the press and how they can really change attitudes and beliefs with the knowledge. Yes, yes, I, I, I do think. Um, what is it Thomas Jefferson was supposed to say? That they said if, if you had to choose between a free press and a democratic government, which would you choose? And something to the effect that he said, I would choose the free press, because with the free press, eventually we would have the democratic government again. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. democratic government could evolve into a dictatorship without a free press. So I, I think... You know, if you want to understand, the free press is full of flawed people like myself who, who get it wrong sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I think if you want to know what it's like not to have a free press, then you just have to look at the examples of Russia or China, mm -hmm. you know, and how the people's lives are much more constricted because they can't get information. Press doesn't always get it right, mm -hmm. but as long as they're free and not controlled by the government or anybody else, mm -hmm we have a chance of getting the information we need. But it's not an easy job. <laughs> no, no, it's not an easy job. And, and, it, and, it's, and it's funny because what, what I do, if I was at a um, metropolitan level uh, in a big city, would not be that unusual. But I think someone writing opinions the way I do at a local level is unusual these days. I mean, we used to have people like Dick White and Hank Seaman, who wrote columns, and right. there was this tradition, but as newspapers got smaller and smaller, you really didn't see people writing opinion as much. I think Beth David does it a little bit over at the Fairhaven Neighborhood News. Yeah. And I, I think that it's good to be humble about that if you, if you can, but, but um, there's a role for that, and I, I think it's um, an important role, and I, I try to live up to it. That's great. Any upcoming projects for New Bedford Light? We are doing a big project this year on addiction okay. and um, what, uh, how, how addiction uh, has really proliferated to all aspects of American life with the opioid epidemic and uh, some of the very dangerous drugs that are around nowadays. And so we hope to um, uh, shed some light in a positive way about that subject. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that would be very rewarding. Yeah. And uh, how about for you personally? Any uh, upcoming projects that you're going to be uh, involved with? No, no. I, uh, uh, my personal life is my personal life. Uh, <laughs> uh, they call it personal for a reason. Right, right. Um, uh, but I, I do hope to travel a little bit and um, uh, kick back and enjoy myself a little more. Do you find even when you're traveling on your personal time, you're still working somewhat? <laughs> it's hard to let it go, yeah. but I think you have to let it go. But if you have a great story, you'll make sure you get it, though, <laughs> even if you're away, I'm sure. Well, I'll be calling somebody else to get it. <laughs> <laughs> that's wise. That's wise. So any other final thoughts on being an editor, being a, a person that does journalism? No, I, 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 as I said, I, I've just been so lucky to have had this career. It's been a great career for me. Uh, I think it's... You asked about young people. I think it is a great career. Mm -hmm. I think you have to be realistic about what it can and can't give you. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really an honor to be able to do this work, sure. to provide information to people, and I think um, it's important work. Well, we want to thank you, Jack, for all you've done, for all the education that you've given our community and continue to give our community because we need journalism, we need the free press, and we need people like you. So thank you, Jack. Thank you, Charlie.